Good morning. The committee meeting will come to order. As is the new tradition of this uh, committee, we will begin by reading the oversight mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know their money Washington spends and takes is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Today's hearing is the second time this committee has met in two weeks to consider the effects of wasteful spending have on the Federal Government, the economy, and the taxpayers. This week's GAO report exposes serious government breakdowns in effective and efficient use of taxpayer dollars. By conservative estimates, the duplication and fragmentation highlighted in the GAO report represents over $100 billion in annual losses. Yet, there was great consternation and 90 hours of hard debate in order to propose just $62 billion in cuts. The GAO report, unlike the cuts, is not about eliminating services. It is about standardizing, combining, and eliminating duplicative services that cost the American people money without serving an additional use. Meaning, if we cut the bureaucracy, if we cut so many of these programs that repeat and repeat, each of them having high paid and high ranking individuals and IT uh, groups and separate publishing and, uh, uh, if you will, advertising campaigns, we can eliminate cost without the American people suffering one loss of the essential services believed to be done by these programs. I am sure in future times we will have additional hearings on programs that should simply go away, whether it is one or a hundred within government. But today we are going to meet with three very talented and very educated individuals who are going to help us understand what should be a win-win for the American people. Win-win because we are not talking about cuts. We are talking about cuts in bureaucracy. Cuts in bureaucracy save money while delivering a better product to the taxpayers. And with that, I would like to yield the remainder of my time to the gentleman from uh, Florida, Mr. Mack, for his comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I appreciate the, uh, the hearing today, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Uh, you know, but something strikes me as odd, uh, and that is we have heard the President say over and over again, and, and let me just quote, uh, that he is going to conduct an exhaustive line-by-line -line review of the Federal budget and seek to eliminate government programs that are not performing. Well, that is something we can all agree with, uh, but yet we have seen no action on the President's words. Then we have a hearing today where we invite the Director of OMB, which is um, a presidential appointee, and he refuses to show up. So is the President serious about doing a line-by-line -line review? Is the Director of the OMB, is he trying to hide or duck the questions? I mean, it's, it's outrageous that we find ourselves at a hearing where we have an opportunity to do something good for the American people, and that is cut spending and cut this budget uh, and get rid of waste. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you talked about the duplication and $100 billion, and the director of OMB won't show up for the, for, to give us an opportunity to ask questions and find out what we can do to, to cut this $100 billion, to find another $100 billion to cut, to try to bring this budget in line. Uh, I think it is outrageous that um, the director doesn't show up. I, I think it shows a disregard to the legislative branch and the, the uh, separation of powers. 
Uh, it, it says to me that the administration uh, and the director of OMB is more interested in uh, talking a good game out in the public but doesn't really want to get to the hard work. Uh, so, so, Mr. Chairman, I look, forward to, um, I look forward to this panel. I look forward to your leadership, but I am extremely disappointed that uh, the director didn't show up. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure that this administration is serious about cutting spending uh, if they can't even send uh, the, the director. I thank, thank the you. gentleman thank reclaiming you. my time. Uh, our invitation to the Office of Management Budget will remain open. I thank the gentleman for his comments. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for calling this hearing today. And I just want to re uh, go immediately to what uh, Congressman Mack just said. Um, I don't think the President is hiding. He, he, uh, the, or the OMB is hiding anything. The fact is, is that the President, uh, in his State of the Union, made it clear uh, that he is about the business of addressing these issues. And OMB is currently in the process of conducting his own analysis of effective ways to streamline the government, improve services, and cut unnecessary costs. This task is critical to ensuring Federal programs are working as effectively and efficiently as possible. And that is why I signed a letter with the Chairman requesting for ongoing updates uh, as OMB takes on this monumental task. As my understanding, that letter will be going out as soon as we get the signatures of two Senators uh, Collins and Lieberman, I think it is. Uh, but I want to make it clear, and I do believe that, uh, again, one of the things uh, about this Chairman, I know he likes to do things effectively and efficiently. And so I would think that OMB, there will come a time when OMB will appear before us and will be in a better and the best position to provide some testimony that would be uh, helpful. Now, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, it is certainly uh, good to see all of our witnesses here today. Uh, and to Chairman Davis, it is a pleasure to see you again. Your name has been uh, evoked quite favorably around here. And so it is good to see you and Mr. Darrell and Mr. And his picture is si shining picture. down on us. Oh, my too. goodness. <laughs> and Ms. Alexander, it is good to see you again. Today we will hear the results of a report issued by the Government Accountability Office on duplicative uh, programs and major opportunities to enhance federal, federal revenues. First, GAO's report demonstrates that there are real opportunities to streamline Federal programs save taxpayer dollars and deliver services more effectively and efficiently. For example, GAO identified at least 31 entities within the Defense Department that are supposed to address the urgent needs of war fighters. GAO reported that there are challenges with the Department's fragmented guidance. And GAO raised concerns about the numbers and the roles of the various entities and processes involved. Solving these problems will take dedication, bipartisanship, but it will help both American troops and taxpayers. GAO's report also describes numerous areas where we can recover hundreds of billions of dollars in Federal revenues. For example, GAO highlights that the United States is essentially giving away up to $53 billion to oil companies that are not paying royalties on certain leases to extract oil and gas from Federal lands. That is our money. A lot has been said about what the taxpayers said uh, during the last election. Well, one of the things that they said is they don't want to be cheated of their own money. Congress passed legislation in 1995 to give oil companies so-called royalty relief. The goal of the legislation was to encourage production by exempting oil companies from paying royalties to the Federal Government. The legislation was supposed to require companies to start paying royalties when they recouped their investment and began making a profit. But the legislation was poorly drafted, and when oil companies challenged it in court, they successfully avoided paying any royalties at all. In its report, GAO concluded that this problem could result in $21 billion to $53 billion in lost revenue to the Federal Government. This windfall is going uh, to an industry that is making staggering profits despite the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, you need significant work. We need to do significant work on this, and you have. You have been a leader in this area. And, and as a matter of fact, in 2009, you issued a report warning about what would happen if these companies won their lawsuit. You said any company that entered a similar lease between 1996 and 2000 could escape paying royalties. That was what you said. You also said this. The Fifth Circuit decision may force the Federal Government to reimburse companies who have already tendered royalty payments.
depending upon the market price of oil and natural gas, the total cost of foregone royalties could, could total nearly $80 billion, end of quote. Mr. Chairman, you warned about this problem, and I commend you. I really do for that. But now we need to fix it. We got to fix it, and it is going to take a bipartisan effort. Uh, we just had a, a vote in the House where uh, we had an opportunity to fix it, and we were not able to. And so I think, as Mr. Davis has said many times, uh, this is one where we can come together as Democrats and Republicans. It is a win-win situation, but it is a win-win. It is not a win just for Republicans, not a win just for Democrats, but most importantly, it is a win for the American people. And I just don't want to be sitting here 10 years from now saying the same things, having lost even more money. And so I look forward to the hearing, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you. And I, with that, I yield back. I thank the Ranking Member, and all members will have seven legislative days in, in, in which to submit their opening statements for the record. I now go to our distinguished panel, the Honorable Thomas M. Davis III, former chairman of this committee. As the Ranking Member said, he looks down on us every day. Now the Director of Federal Government Affairs at Deloitte and Touche and the man who issued the subpoenas to the oil companies on my behalf in order to begin the process of doing the oversight on those flawed contracts that have cost the American people tens of billions of dollars. And I want to thank you for that today publicly. The Honorable Gene Dodaro, the Controller of the United States, appearing, I think, for the second time as the confirmed controller versus the many times that you appeared before us graciously as the acting your work as a legislative branch employee spanning both the executive and legislative branch, providing more than 3,000 people who give us the nonpartisan reports and fact-finding that we absolutely rely on. And Ms. Ryan Alexander, President of the Taxpayers for Common Sense, an often contributor, and welcome back. Pursuant to the committee's rules, all witnesses are asked to be sworn in before they testify before this committee. If you would please raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you were about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that all witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Please be seated. In order to allow time for discussion, and as my predecessor would say, a longstanding tradition is that you will have five minutes, there will be a green light for as long as you may talk freely, there will be a yellow light to warn you that your time is elapsing, and I will, I will be understanding for you to complete your sentence or paragraph, but not much more once it turns red, and that will allow a healthy dialogue afterwards. The Chair recognizes Mr. Davis for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Issa and Ranking Member uh, Cummings and colleagues, and thanks for the opportunity to testify before you today. And I am doing so in my capacity as a former uh, member of the House and specifically chairman of this committee. And I want to thank Gene Dodaro and his staff for putting together an outstanding report that forms the basis of today's uh, hearing. And, and let me just say, I, I hope we can engage OMB before this is done, because we are in this together, Republicans, Democrats, the House. Uh, Senate, executive branch, uh, we all caused the problem. And I think we all need to be there to solve it as we look forward to this. And uh, I'm disappointed they are not here today, but I think in the future we need to make sure they are engaged. I think they are doing some things over there we need to hear about. During my tenure, I examined how the government could operate uh, more efficiently, focusing on governance issues, procurement, IT policy, civil service, governmental organization. In this process, I have long said the way we try to extract savings from the Federal Government is to simply cut off fingers and toes rather than to go after the fat that is molded throughout the body politic. I still believe that is the case, but as we see in the GAO report issued earlier this week, sometimes Uncle Sam does indeed have a few too many digits and some surgery may well be in order. So where does the blame lie? As I noted, there is plenty of blame to go around. There are a lot of places to point the finger, and let me start with, with Congress. Duplicative and uh, overlapping programs free frequently exist because of the way that we, we in Congress legislate. Indeed, one of the earliest and most enduring lessons I learned upon my election to the House was that jurisdiction trumps all. 
So while two different members believe there may be a need for a given Federal service, they will surely write the authorizing legislation with their individual committees in mind. For example, if a member of the Education Workforce Committee wants to enact a job training program, they will write the legislation to ensure it falls under an agency in that committee's purview. The same would be true of a member of the Veterans Administration. A member of the Financial Services might link job training to low-income people in order to guide such a program to HUD. Thus, we find three different programs with essentially the same goal, job training under three different agencies. Under this arrangement, they are all funded differently, measured differently, and administered differently. Common sense suggests they should be combined to take advantage of economies of scale or even just to make it easier for the citizens to know uh, where the programs exist. We can blame the bureaucracy, but in many ways, in Congress, created the many-headed monster we bemoan in an attempt to protect the, our jurisdictional prerogatives. Another point that should be examined in the quest to corral duplicative or overlapping programs or to implement broad personnel reforms, the need to implement government-wide solutions is often discussed. But while the executive branch has the ability to affect such efforts to a certain degree, again, the compartmentalization uh, the, the, uh, approach that Congress takes often prevents the type of holistic action required. This is especially true of the appropriations process in which all the subcommittees would have to agree to provide funding for a given initiative, a task akin to asking a cat to take a bath. Finally, there are areas where unnecessary duplication at the Federal level has ramifications at the State and local levels. Congress should examine the myriad reporting requirements of Federal programs, human service programs, educational programs, and transportation programs to see where we can make better use of consolidated systems. With existing technology, it seems unnecessary to have every State maintain its own reporting system for a given Federal program when essentially the same information is required from everybody. Government-wide in the executive branch, the same culture exists. Too many agencies have erected stovepipes for the delivery of IT services, personnel rules, and internal protocols. The result is that seamless congruencies in communications and information sharing are rare between government departments. Information gets lost, analysis becomes disjointed, and operability becomes hindered. OMB can serve as an effective catalyst for establishing cooperation and communication between agencies, which could in turn lead to an exponential increase in efficiency. It has the authority and the mandate to do so. Unfortunately, in the administrations of both parties, the Office of Management and Budget simply becomes the Office of Budget. The concentration falls on the budgetary aspects of agency spending when, in fact, a management review could yield much more long-term savings. The key to success is focusing how services are delivered, how services are procured, and how information is gathered and analyzed. In these areas, the executive branch seems to be deficient. Reorganizations, mergers, and assimilations of redundant programs are not government skill sets. Often, attempts to reorganize are thwarted by inadequate time constraints, unwilling employee participants, and skeptical Federal managers who know that a slow roll or weighted out approach will always trump the most ambitious change management efforts. So what can Congress do and what can OMB do to improve the situation? From the Congressional standpoint, a complete restructuring of the committee system is unlikely. A first step to avoiding a program duplication or inefficiency, however, might be a CBO-like review of newly proposed programs prior to floor consideration. In closing, let me just say there are good, dedicated people working in government, but upon examination of how they are employed, it is clear that some of them are doing tasks they don't need to be doing, performing under regulations that didn't need to be written, filling out forms that shouldn't have been printed. I hope today's hearing marks the start of an effort and a sustained effort to address these issues. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts. I look forward to your questions and ask that my entire statement be put in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Dodaro. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. I am very pleased to be here today to talk about the GAO report, which outlines opportunities to tackle overlap and duplication, reduce costs, and enhance revenue collections. Our report discusses 34 different areas of overlap and duplication and fragmentation, and it uh, outlines a number of specific uh, activities that need to be reviewed. I would highlight a, a couple of categories here this morning. One, there are uh, multiple programs in specific areas that have developed over the years uh, and that need to, to be tackled. For example, there are over 40 programs in employment and training areas. Uh, there are over 80 programs trying, at least in part, to improve teacher quality. There are 80 programs intended to improve economic development. 
Uh, surface transportation has multiple programs as well. These programs have developed over the years, in some cases decades. Uh, and in many cases, there is really not a lot of empirical evidence to show the outcomes of the programs or that they are operating effectively. This is a perfect opportunity for the Congress and the administration to look at these portfolio of programs that we have outlined in our reports and to begin to rationalize the programs, prioritize what the role of the Federal Government should be, uh, and uh, give clear directions as to what is to be accomplished through the programs, how to measure their results, and how to uh, streamline delivery systems and also reduce administrative costs. I think there is a lot of opportunities here. Uh, we also outline in the defense area opportunities there in medical commands, uh, urgent needs, as was mentioned in the opening uh, comments. Uh, and there are other areas where DOD and VA can leverage their purchasing power, for example, in purchasing of, of drugs. They are also pursuing parallel paths in developing electronic medical records that there are opportunities to conserve and re resources and get better results for less cost, we believe. Uh, in addition to the overlap, fragmentation and duplication, uh, we also outline uh, a number of other opportunities for cost savings and enhanced revenues. Uh, 47 areas are outlined in the report. Many of the cost saving opportunities go to the nuts and bolts of the government and how it operates, uh, as Chairman Davis outlined. Uh, there is a need to make sure there is more competition and contracting, uh, that there are fewer contracting vehicles to help reduce the costs we are paying uh, to maintain unneeded uh, Federal property. Uh, we are paying through improper payments for services that either aren't rendered or are not well documented, that we have uh, confidence that they are being saved or appropriately paid. Uh, and in the revenue area, uh, there is a yawning gap in, at the tax level uh, between taxes owed and collected. The last estimate is $290 billion. And there are areas that we believe through prudent use of increasing the, the uh, electronic filing, using third party data to identify uh, potential non-filers and other activities that need to be looked at. Now, one of the things that we are going to continue to do since this report is the first report uh, that meets our statutory requirement to annually produce these type of reports, uh, we will be looking at other opportunities going forward, tax expenditures, for example, and how they might uh, duplicate other things. For example, in this report we mentioned the uh, tax credit in the ethanol area duplicates the renewable uh, fuel standards that are in place, and that Congress should take a look at the need uh, to uh, continue this ethanol tax credit, which is uh, billions of dollars a year in foregone revenue. There is potential overlap between tax credits, loan programs, and other Federal spending. So we will be looking at these areas in the future. Uh, we already have work underway for our next year's report. And we look forward to working with the Congress to help streamline the Federal Government's activities to make sure it is operating more effectively, more efficiently, and in the taxpayers' best interest. Uh, so Mr. Chairman, uh, that concludes my opening statement. I will be happy to answer questions uh, at the appropriate time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back 14 seconds. <laughs> Ms. Alexander, please. Uh, good morning, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. Thank you in, for inviting me here to testify today. Our mission at Taxpayers for Common Sense is to achieve a government that spends taxpayer dollars responsibly and operates within its means. All of our work reflects our core belief that no one, no matter where they fall on the political spectrum, wants to see their money wasted. To that end, TCS has worked with the left and the right to achieve victories on stopping the bridge to nowhere, getting the earmark moratorium enacted, cutting funding for an alternate engine for the Joint Strike Fighter and creating an Inspector General for the Iraq War. We have testified before this committee several times with proven results for American taxpayers. We testified on the cost overruns and problems with the F-22 Raptor, and that program was stopped. When Mr. Davis was on the dais, we testified on crop insurance waste, prompting the Agriculture Committee to take action. And working with you, Chairman Issa, we have testified on Army Corps of Engineers issues and worked with the Committee regarding lost royalty revenues from offshore oil and gas leases, both of which are in the GAO report we are discussing today. In addition to my written testimony, I would like to enter for the record our two recent reports detailing recommended budget cuts. 
In our more than 15-year history, TCS has worked on many of the programs and issues highlighted in the GAO report. We hope the increased scrutiny generated by this report, the current political will to tame the deficit, and the good work of this committee will lead to meaningful and overdue reform or elimination of many of these programs. Obviously, there is much too much to tackle in this voluminous report in five minutes or even 50, so I will just highlight a few, minute, a few issues. Across the government, GAO found examples of duplication. Reforms to the acquisition process government-wide could yield significant savings. This is particularly true in the Pentagon, where the risks of duplication across services are high. Efforts to acquire weapons like tactical wheeled vehicles should be coordinated across services. Encouraging competition in interagency contracting can help drive down costs by as much as $500 billion by GAO's estimate. And as uh, Mr. Dodaro mentioned, coordinating between DOD and Veterans Affairs electronic health record systems and working together to control costs in the area of drug purchasing. Real property management by GSA also has enormous possible savings, both from disposing of billions of dollars worth of unnecessary Federal property, better fleet vehicle management, and better cost analysis of purchasing and leasing decisions. In addition to opportunities to reduce spending, the GAO report highlighted important ways to enhance revenue, another critical element of reducing our deficit. Giveaways to the oil and gas industry through royalty management and collection systems have been highlighted by the GAO report GAO numerous times and added to the high risk list this year. Chairman Issa, you know all too well from your work on these problems uh, resulting from the royalty relief provided in the mid-1990s to oil and gas companies operating in the Gulf of Mexico. The problems stemming from the Deepwater Royalty Relief Act, including a portfolio of leaseholders that pay no royalties at all for oil and gas extracted from Federal waters, will cost taxpayers up to $53 billion in the next 25 years. The GAO report notes that almost $1 trillion in Federal revenue was foregone in fiscal year 2009 due to tax expenditures, what the Simpsons Bolts Commission called tax earmarks. The 173 tax expenditures are similar to spending programs and can be the same magnitude or larger than related Federal spending in some mission areas, except without the oversight. We believe this is an area for this committee could play a critical role in increasing accountability, examining effectiveness, and saving taxpayer dollars. In its recent report, GAO says reductions in revenue losses from eliminating ineffective or redundant tax expenditures could be substantial. Tax expenditure performance is an area that would benefit from enhanced congressional scrutiny as Congress considers ways to address the Nation's long-term fiscal imbalance. Last year, for example, GAO recommended that Congress modify the research tax credit to reduce windfalls to taxpayers for research spending they would have done anyway, and this report suggests changes to the new markets tax credit as well as reviewing the tax-exempt status of government bonds. Evaluating these tax expenditures for effectiveness and value and eliminating the largest corporate tax loopholes would pave the way for simplifying the corporate tax structure, lowering overall rates, and establishing an important level of certainty for the business community. Other tax, expenders, such, tax expenditures, such as the mortgage interest deduction or deduction for State sales tax, should also be considered. Reforming Federal activities related to corn ethanol would be a double whammy, eliminating redundant programs and enhancing revenue in one fell swoop. The use of ethanol is mandated, it is protected from foreign competition, and it is subsidized. Any one of these redundant and market-distorting policy options might be proposed to help an emerging industry. It is indefensible that a ma the mature corn ethanol industry continues to benefit from the decades-old refundable tax credit to blend ethanol at a cost of, to taxpayers of more than $5 billion per year. Clearly, the GAO has given Congress much to think about. Eliminating duplication and waste in government and responsibly enhancing revenue are the critical first steps to addressing our $1.65 trillion budget deficit. I thank the gentlelady. You beat Mr. Dodaro. You yielded back 18 seconds. This is probably a record for any committee. I now yield myself five minutes. Uh, Mr. Davis, the work you did while you were here uh, continues on, but as you can see, there is uh, there's more to do. When we start looking at duplicative programs, uh, from your experience on this side of the dais, do you recommend uh, that if the, uh, the committee authors legislation that we use carrot or stick or both? For example, we could look at these programs and we could simply say through appropriations, we are only going to fund X amount. Now you have to figure out how to combine these rather than perhaps only eliminating them when you run out of money, period? Or do we create legislative uh, authority for pools of savings being combined and thus create an opportunity in which there is a carrot for agencies that come together, such as the electronic uh, medical records, if, in fact, DOD and our 
previously serving members, often known as veterans, can simply come together and realize they are dealing with the same people and yet dealing stovepipe with two different systems. How do you view those two options? I like the carrot better, simply because when you try to starve a budget, they look within their budget. They don't look at how they can share savings with another agency. It is just not in the nature of the beast. Uh, if you can incentivize groups to work together in, in uh, those kind of shared savings environments, uh, you can do much better. Look, organizations are incentivized. You have to look at how they are incentivized. They are hesitant to give up to control or to partner because they don't know what authority they may lose over the long haul. So when it comes to uh, shared savings, we are not getting the sustainability we need. Um, I would do something like mandating agencies to uh, look at two or three lines of businesses within each one where they could shave, uh, share some of these instead of putting them into stovepipes. But just starving them doesn't incentivize them to work with other agencies, unfortunately. That is just not the nature of the beast. I appreciate that. Mr. Dodaro. I agree with Mr. Davis. I, I think the incentives. He's not chairman are, anymore. Right, you know, you don't right. actually have to oh, agree okay. with him. Yeah. <laughs> no, in this case, I mean it. Uh, 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 uh. I, I think there are disincentives in the budget process, for example, and, and the way the appropriate the money is is there. It's difficult to collaborate across agencies, and I think there could be more flexibilities that way. Also. Uh, the ideas that you posit there I think are also true at the State and local level in dealing with Federal agencies on grants. Like, for example, we have recommended that uh, the Federal agencies look at incentives for, for States to combine uh, in the employment and training area. Now, a lot of these programs are delivered through State and local administrative structures, and a lot of times they have to set up separate structures in order to uh, uh, deliver multiple Federal programs. So I think there is a lot of opportunities for incentives and some flexibility. Quick follow-up on that. So since so much of what is delivered in programs like that is, in fact, presidential earmarks often called grants and competitive grants and so on, should we require that the executive branch do that consolidation, recognize that if you are going to give five pots of money that do substantially the same thing, all from the executive branch and all on many of them non-formula? that, in fact, that they be combined. It, it, do you think that that is a wise piece of uh, legislative, or should we try to work, if you will, to combine with the administration in their own best interest? Or lastly, should we give the States authority to essentially combine grants so that no matter where they come from, they can merge them, uh, which is something that uh, Governor Barber has talked about, where he gets different puddles of money and each one is with different strings. How, how do you view those various options to try to get the efficiencies? Yeah, I, th I think all the options are, are very valid ideas. At the, at the Federal level, I think there are opportunities to consolidate these various programs. Uh, and for example, we understand in the Administration's proposal for reauthorizing in the education area, actually 38 programs that we have identified are proposed to consolidate into five. There are some thoughts on surface transportation, clearly that. I do think the uh, States should have some flexibility to show, and, uh, and they can do it in a, in a way to help reduce some of their own costs. As you know, they are struggling right. uh, with their own fiscal stress, and give them some flexibility to combine, as long as there is proper accountability. Uh, in place. One of the things we have said is that there is not enough tracking of unobligated balances in a lot of the grant programs. Uh, so I think that uh, all those could work. I appreciate that. Ms. Alexander, just a, a quick one. On your, in your opening statement, when you took on one of the, uh, the hardest pillars to take on around here, the ethanol subsidy, uh, and, and I appreciate that, how do you propose that we begin the process of, of dealing, do, doing away with one of the obvious non-fossil fuel uh, waste in government. Uh, do you suggest that we, we, in fact, take that $5 billion and simply force it to be put into renewable for, uh, fuels more broadly so there can be competition from what most would call the more promising for fossil fuels? Or do you have an alternate suggestion? Our preference would be to have that be savings and that be savings that go to deficit reduction. That has been our preference in terms of the elimination of VTEC for, for several years. I think um, in, many, in many ways, you know, the answer on, on VTEC for us is just it, this just can expire. It is done at the end of this year. It could have been done last year. So we don't see a need for replacing it 
There are lots of efforts to look at new and more promising fuels, but I don't think that they need to be tied to VTEC. That is just a failed Thank policy that is redundant. Thank you very much. I recognize the ranking member for his question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The, um, you know, Mr. Dodaro, one of the things that I found interesting about your report is you, um, in the report, it said DOD made major revisions to its acquisition policies. And um, you went on to say more emphasis was placed on knowledge about the requirements, technology, and designs. And I found that when, as chairman of the Coast Guard subcommittee, what we discovered when we were dealing with the Deep Water Project, where they were buying $25 billion worth of hardware over 25 years and had boats that didn't float, part of the problem, literally, literally, part of the problem was the acquisitions process. In other words, they didn't have people who knew what they were doing with regard to specifications with regard to putting together contracts, with determining, you know, when something, performance was done. They even had the contractors determining uh, when bonuses would be given. And so I am just trying to dig deep in here with this DOD, because that's, we see a lot of money going out the door there. Um, how far have they gotten with that whole acquisitions process? You said they have made some movements. But what do you, I mean, what do you see that how much progress have they made, and do you see other things that they can be done in, that can be done in that regard? I think uh, basically, for example, in the weapon systems acquisition, they put in place as a result of congressional uh, laws of Weapon Systems Acquisition Reform Act of 2009. They put good policies and, and practices in their regulations and manuals, but they need to implement them more consistently across. The department. And how can we get them to do that? I guess that is the question. Well, I think uh, there is no substitute for regular congressional oversight. And, and I think, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Chairman Davis, you said you talked to earlier to me privately about it has to be a sustained effort. And how do we sustain? I know with the Coast Guard, we just kept bringing them back over and over and over again. And we got things done. And we ser served, I mean, saved, I am sure, a few billion dollars in a very few years. But I am trying to figure out how do we keep that, you know, that, that sustained effort, uh, Chairman Davis? Yeah, uh, two things. One of the difficulties in sustaining this in government is that you have people are replaced over right. a period of time. Right. Uh, they have a lot of other priorities. Uh, I, I liken it to mergers and acquisitions. Mm -hmm. In the private sector, when you merge, you, you, it is costs. You have to take those out. You need to stay competitive. Uh, you have strict timelines. You have management oversight from above. So many times in government you have costs that look good at the front end on paper, but by the time uh, they are translated two or three years, it's, it sometimes ends up costing you yeah. because you have this weighted out atmosphere. And it's one other thing on, on the procurement. We don't, still don't have enough procurement uh, officers. There is a paucity of procurement officers at the Pentagon and other. They need to hire and train more people in these areas. It saves money in the long time to have good people behind there. And Mr. Dodaro, let me just go. I only have a few minutes left, two minutes left. Um, your report also says that the United States is essentially giving oil companies up to $53 billion uh, because back in 1995 Congress exempted them from paying royalties on certain leases in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, there are some oil companies today that are paying no royalties to the American taxpayers on certain leases. Uh, as part of this so-called royalty relief program, these companies are removing the oil and gas which belongs to the American people, selling it and making record profits. And so I am just trying to figure, this is our money, isn't it? Well, basically, you know, we have recommended that uh, there has not been a comprehensive look in 25 years of what the Federal Government is charging uh, for these leases. And when they are ranked, the uh, U.S. Government is ranked against other countries and even some states, we rank very low as to what we are asking for on a regular basis for return on the leases for these lands. Interior has finally uh, agreed to do that comprehensive assessment. It is supposed to be completed this year. I would encourage the Congress to review that uh, study uh, and to make sure that there are proper uh, incentives. We have also said, uh, Mr. Cummings, that uh, the, there is not enough verification of the production that is occurring on uh, those lands in order to make sure the government is getting its fair return. Mm -hmm. 
And we uh, and you put this on on your high risk list. Is that right? That, that's correct. And why was that? Well, uh, we believed that the there wasn't reasonable assurance that the federal government was getting uh, the revenues that they were due uh, as a result of those leases for two of the reasons that I mentioned before. In other words, we're being cheated. Well. I think it's not clear that we have reasonable assurance we're getting everything we should. And that you from said our it in a very nice way, but the fact is, it's right. money that's due the American people on our land, and we're not getting it. There and let me tell you something: if that happened anywhere, if people were being cheated, uh, folks would be going to jail in my district. As a matter of fact, if somebody steals a, a three hundred dollar bike, they go to jail. So uh, here we got billions drifting away. And at the same time, we are trying to find money to make sure that, uh, that kids can go to school and have teachers and all that kind of thing. But this, it, this is, has to be a priority. And I know the Chairman has made it a big, this is a big issue for the Chairman. And I am really looking forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, as we tackle this problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, a, a quick note on the uh, ethanol. Uh, count me in on uh, Finding those savings and uh, and and uh, you know on a personal issue, it, the ethanol has been screwing up my my boat motor, uh, <clears throat> so count me in. Um, a minute ago, the uh, the ranking member said that uh, the uh, OMB um, wasn't here partly because they're planning and they're doing you know, but boy, wouldn't it have been a great way to plan to actually come to the hearing and uh, get some input? Uh, and share their thoughts. Um, and, and the ranking member also said that um, one of the ways that they were able to get some savings and be effective in another committee with dealing with the Coast Guard was keep bringing them back. Well, I'd like the OMB to show up for the first time so we can keep bringing them back and figuring out ways to, to save some money. Um, and, I, and I'm going to uh, let me let me start with this. Um, Mr. Dodaro, uh, has the administration had any reaction to your report so far? Uh, I have not talked to them uh, about the report. We have, there are some areas in here in our high risk list that we have made uh, a number of attempts to have discussions with OMB and the agencies on the high risk list and the GAO. So we are engaged in regular discussions on that. Uh, I do believe the announcement also yesterday. Uh, that they were proposing a commission to deal with the Federal real property issue was uh, in response uh, to this report as well. I do plan to follow up with them uh, and to try to uh, create uh, dialogue uh, to make sure that all these issues are addressed. But they, they haven't had a reaction. And it, w it would be nice if the Director of OMB was here so we could ask him that question. Yeah, my, my understanding is yesterday that the uh, deputy for management over at OMB, Jeff Zients, said that they are on the same page as we are. And, and um, uh, Mr. Davis, um, good to see you again. Uh, isn't, isn't this really, I mean, I, I remember uh, my first term here when we were in the majority. Uh, did, weren't there reports and uh, didn't the President, uh, President Bush at the time, didn't, didn't they come out with programs that were duplicative and in nature that could be uh, uh, done away with. And I mean, th so this is, a this is a real problem. This isn't just, this isn't the first report or the first time that we have learned that the Federal Government is uh, wasting money by having duplicative programs. Now, now Mr. Mack, unfortunately it is a soap opera. I think Mr. Dare would agree with that. There are uh, things that have been in that high risk list for a generation. And it takes a, a sustained effort on the part of Republicans and Democrats up here working with the administration to get these done. And the problem is just keeping your eye on the ball with everything else that goes on. And when you cut budgets, when you go through CRs, these are the kind of things that fall through the, the, uh, the cracks. Uh, you still have the Pentagon books aren't auditable. Uh, so how do you know where you are on these kind of things? So, yeah, it is a soap opera. Yeah. Um, and uh, Mr. Dodoro, uh, can you give us any recommendations on what might be some of the low-hanging fruit? Some of the, you know, I mean, I, you know, Mr. Chairman, if we could, if we could move on any of these, uh, I think it would be a, a sign in, uh, of moving in the right direction. So, is there any kind of low-hanging fruit things that are so either ridiculous in nature uh, that um, by not acting 
uh, you know, is kind of a, a, a shame? Uh, I think my, my recommendation would be to first build off where there is pretty good consensus about the need to streamline. Like, for example, uh, in the areas I mentioned about multiple programs, there are some recommendations of the administration, for example, in the employment and training area to reduce and consolidate some of the programs. In surface transportation, there is agreement, teacher uh, uh, quality, improving those programs, consolidating in the education field. There are some common agreements there. So my suggestion would be to build off where there is consensus as a starting point. Uh, a number of these areas are also, uh, as uh, Mr. Davis mentioned, on our high risk list. There uh, we have seen progress. I would say the uh, real uh, point, though, we took two areas off the list this last update, and both of those areas had more than a dozen congressional hearings uh, and a lot of dialogue with the administration to produce the results that were there. It, it requires top-level attention, metrics on progress, but there is a lot of opportunities uh, to do this. Uh, there are also opportunities in the real property area, Federal real property, that is uh, uh, not needed. It needs to be disposed of. We're, we're spending, by latest estimates, almost over $1.6 billion a year to maintain property that's underutilized. That doesn't make sense. There should be more competition and contracting. About a third of the uh, contracts that were put in place or had either no competition or only one bidder uh, on the competition. Uh, there's also uh, $640 million uh, sitting in a customs uh, collection account uh, for a number of years that there haven't been decisions on how to use. Uh, that could be clearly an easy and quick uh, win there. Uh, and there is also a lot of money going out the door in improper payments uh, that I think could be stopped. That is going to take some time and effort. Uh, we have talked about the use of technology there, and I, but I think that is another area where the latest estimate, and, and not all programs have been estimated yet, the latest estimates are about $125 billion. And so, so I think there are plenty of targets of opportunity, and we would be happy to work with the Congress and the administration to get results. I thank, thank you very much, and thank, thank you, Mr. The, Chairman. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Alexander. I would like to ask you, as President of Taxpayers for Common Sense, for your take on the American people giving the most profitable industry in the world a $53 billion gift. I would like to break this down in layman's terms. And if, I'm, uh, if I have any misperceptions about this, maybe you could help me with it. Due to a flaw in the 1995 Outer Continental Shelf Deepwater Royalty Relief Act, numerous oil companies are now drilling in the Gulf of Mexico in Federal lands and paying no royalties to the Federal Government. Is that correct? And as we have heard, GAO, could, could you say that louder? I that, my microphone was not. I am sorry. That is right. There are, there are that, companies that is correct. paying no royalties right now okay. as a result of an error at Interior and the, and the, structure, the structure of the Deepwater Royalty Relief Act and a subsequent court case. Thank you. Now, as we have heard, GAO reports that U.S. taxpayers could lose as much as $53 billion as a result of this. And it has already begun. In fiscal year 2011 alone, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Regulation and Enforcement estimates that we will lose $1.4 billion. In contrast, the oil industry is making staggering profits. For example, the top five oil companies reported profits of $485 billion from 2005 to 2009. ExxonMobil, the largest American oil company, reported a 53 percent increase in its fourth quarter profits. Chevron, the number two American oil company, reported fourth quarter earnings were 72 percent higher than the preceding years. The third largest, ConocoPhillips, reported that its quarterly profit climbed 46 percent. Now, Ms. Alexander, is this an industry that needs billion-dollar giveaways? 
Taxpayers for Common Sense has worked on this issue for a long time, and I think our position is perfectly clear that we do not think that oil companies need these subsidies or really any others. So we think this is an issue that is ripe for Congress to address, and because in some ways it is so outrageous, the problems with the Deepwater Royalty Relief leases, that there should be bipartisan agreement on. These are taxpayer assets that people are taking. If any one of us owned those oil reserves and oil and gas reserves and said, yes, just take it, people would think we were a little crazy. Well, back in 2005, when the oil was at about $55 a barrel, President Bush addressed the American Society of Newspaper Editors. I want to quote to this committee what he said. Quote, I will tell you, with $55 oil, we don't need incentives to the oil companies and gas companies to explore. There are plenty of incentives. What we need is to put a strategy in place that will help this country over time become less dependent, unquote. Uh, Ms. Alexander, would you agree with that statement by President Bush? Uh, I would, and with oil at last I checked about $98 a barrel, it seems like it still applies. So his point makes more sense now, right? Right. And uh, recently, John Hoffmeister, who retired from Shell in 2008 and now runs Citizens for Affordable Energy, told the National Journal that big oil companies don't need government help. Would you agree with, uh, with Mr. Hoffmeister? I would agree that big oil does not need government help. Well, how could we modify this subsidy structure to, Our, encur to encourage a transition to, let us say, clean, renewable energy sources? I, I mean, our position has always been we know what we don't need and we can get rid of it. Congress can come together, come, you know, develop a solution to the problem with the royalty relief leases. and and simply just some of the bigger tax expenditures have significant benefits for oil and gas companies. There are subsidies for oil and gas companies riddled throughout the tax code and through different spending programs. So we think this is an, a big opportunity for there to be bipartisan action for reform that will help close the deficit, you know, just one baby step, and, and let a mature industry stand on its own two feet. These, many of these subsidies the royalty relief problem is not 100 years old, but other oil and gas subsidies are as much as 100 years old, and it is a mature industry that doesn't need them anymore. And these handouts don't do anything to help the American economy, is that right? We think that these handouts are enriching very profitable companies. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Uh, would the gentleman yield for his remaining time for just a follow-up question? Sure. Uh, Ms. Alexander, you, you are nuancing, and I think it is important for everyone that wasn't here when Chairman Davis headed up our investigation. It is the leases that are flawed, not necessarily the law. Isn't that correct? That, that in fact, the leases did not properly have the language to trigger when, fuel price, when oil prices and natural gas prices reached a threshold to actually trigger the royalties. That is the reason that most of this money is not being paid. My understanding is that there is a set of leases that were issued between 1996 and 2000 that are flawed. There was an error in the drafting. Then that, because they didn't have a price th threshold in them, subsequently a court ruled that all the price threshold language in any leases in that period that, that contained them was flawed. And so all of those leases are exempt from royalties right now. So it is, it's, it's a complex problem, but it's not, it's not right. a and I And I do think there is bipartisan support to still to that. try to fix that. I thank you. I am sorry, Mr. Lankford of Oklahoma. Thank you. We d uh, and thanks you all for coming. Uh, we talked earlier today about uh, incentives for agencies to try to look for duplicate waste. Uh, obviously, everyone wants to have more staff, wants to do more things, wants to engage it, and everyone sees the problems and they want to help solve it. What incentives specifically do you see that you think, okay, this is an incentive to help? Because honestly, I have talked with several people that are uh, Federal workers. They see it as well. They see the waste around them. They say, I can't believe we fill out this form. I can't believe we do this. Someone else does this. Uh, they see it. How do we create incentives within that agency to that specific employee to say, when you see it, here is a way to be able to help us get out of it? Well, I will give you a couple of examples. When I was county, head of the county government in Fairfax, I went to my agency heads in a budget time and asked them to cut their budget, and they came up with nothing mm -hmm. when we said, look, of what you can find, you can spend some of this your own way within certain guidelines. Right. They came up with a lot more. Right. Who is interested in cutting their budget if it is going to go to somebody that overspent their budget or if it is going to, quote, a deficit? It is just, it's just not in the nature of the way things work. So that's that, that's one thing you could do. Another thing is we could bring agencies us and ask them to take certain lines of businesses and look for ways to shared savings and report back. Just if it's just two or three lines of business per agency, uh, where right now they are stovepipe, but they could work together. I mean, the best example of that is the health records between VA and DOD. There's no reason you have to do 
the same uh, different sets of health records. Right. Now, I'll give you one other that affects the State, if I can just take a second. Uh, right now, for State governments, we are spending a lot of money on just um, being able to authenticate their communications with the Federal Government. Security standards exist for States to authenticate users uh, to access data in Federally funded systems that are hosted by the State. But each Federal agency interprets the standards differently, so States have to meet each Federal agency standards replicating a different process to various programs. That costs a lot of money. So Social Security uh, uses technology for verification. Department of Justice uh, will use uh, a certain procedures and protocols on that. So they are having to do different things. You ought to have one standard across right. the board for these kinds of things. Okay. That is terrific. Mr. Darrow, you want to mention that as well? I, I think Mr. Davis uh, talked uh, uh, about within each agency, and I, I do agree with his suggestions in terms of forcing uh, people to come up with recommendations. But many things that we point out in our report are multiple agencies involved in the same area. And we believe the only way this is going to get solved is by high level attention within the administration. OMB needs to play a very critical role in this whole uh, endeavor, and the Congress does as well, uh, to provide the right type of incentives there. For example, one of the areas, it is not mentioned in here, but we are going to work on it, it is on our high risk list, is modernizing disability programs. There is about 200 different disability programs. And because of our insistence in working with OMB on the uh, high risk uh, set of meetings I talked about before, we brought together all the agencies involved in that process. It was one of the first times they have ever right. met uh, to be able to discuss that. So I think uh, there are ways to build in incentives and deal with disincentives. Another area that we have recommended before is leasing versus buying. There is a, yeah. there's a, uh, you know, a, a sort of a bias in the, in the rules toward uh, scoring oh, no. that differently, we have recommended that be changed as well. Let me ask you a specific question as well, Mr. Darrow. You, you had mentioned about the uh, contracting vehicles and you are recommending fewer contracting. Have you compiled a list of contracting vehicles you say these should be seriously looked at? Yeah, the, these are uh, contracts that are interagency contracts. And what we have said is they are really not a, a list. The list ought to be compiled by the executive branch. It ought to be made visible, okay. and people should make sure that so, they know. So right now, I know we have a, a multitude of different contracts and systems of contract for procurement. You don't have, a, at this point, a list to say, here are the different contracting vehicles we think are inherently inefficient. We, we, we have the types of vehicles that are inefficient or, or impose more risk to the Federal okay. Government. I would be happy to provide you that list. That would list. be terrific. I would sure. like to be able to have that uh, list as well. Is there a need as well? You are able to reach into all these different agencies and to be able to research them in a way that most people cannot. Uh, what would you you perceive is the need for individuals uh, to be able to reach in and be able to search the data so the agencies can get out uh, their employment, their strategies, their, their, their program philosophies, to be able to go through data and to be able to actually search it, not just a PDF on some website, uh, but actual searchable data. Is there a need for that and is that possible to pull off? Uh, there is definitely a need for it. There is not enough of it and it is possible to pull off. Okay. That is one of the areas I look at and say you have the opportunity to be able to do that, but there are lots of people at home that would like to be able to search that and research that, whether they be journalists, whether they be under individuals, and that is something I would like to see us continue to push on as a committee. I know it has been talked about before, and to continue to find a ways to be able to push and do that. And one last thought on it, sunsetting programs. Is there a, a particular plan that you have seen to say this is a great way to sunset these things out? I, I think there needs to be regular reauthorizations of, of programs. There are too many programs that are created that don't have a regular review and, and process in place. I do think the Federal Government needs to invest more in regular program evaluations. One of the things we find and we talk about in here is a lot of these programs have been operating for years and there is really not a, a, a lot of empirical evidence right. that, of what the returns are and whether they are being effective. So I, I think the Federal Government has in the past shortchanged the program evaluation, and I think it needs to be uh, more put in place on a regular basis. Terrific. Thank you very much. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me welcome the panel in particular, our former chairman um, and my predecessor uh, in this seat in Virginia. Uh, my good friend Tom Davis. Welcome back, Tom. Um, in fact, uh, perhaps, uh, Congressman Davis, we could begin with you. you. You talked about the fact that it would be a wise investment to uh, expand the number of acquisition and procurement personnel within the Federal Government uh, so that we are looking for efficiencies and cost savings. Could you expand on, just a little, on that just a little bit? Because one of the things that certainly has struck a number of people is that Federal contracting increased enormously in the 1990s, but procurement and acquisition personnel within the Federal Government did not keep up with that. 
Well, in fact, in some areas it declined during that time. It was a way to, to cut budgets. In fact, many times you go to a procurement meeting now and what you have is a lot of contractors running the procurements. That is not all bad, but you need a cadre inside a government who understands the toolbox that they have, uh, can figure out what gets the best value for the government. And that needs constant training. It needs all of those kinds of things. And what has happened many times is we end up scrimping on procurement personnel. We lose good personnel to the private sector. And yet that is where you get your cost overruns. That is where you get uh, uh, contracts that aren't performing well because you don't have the appropriate oversight. Uh, along. And that has been my experience. And I think it is money, for the most part, that is pretty well spent, provided you continue to train people once you hire them. I don't know if Jean agrees with that or not, but that is my observation. Well, I think that is definitely the case. For example, at DOD, the amount of contracting on goods and services more than doubled over the past several years, and the acquisition workforce grew less than 1 percent. Uh, and there are efforts now to try to uh, bolster that workforce uh, with proper training and proper oversight. It is a good investment. Yeah, I, I think that is a really good point. I mean, sometimes we get carried away with uh, hmm, things like refuse of Federal spending binge, uh, titles like that. But sometimes we have to make strategic investments, in fact, if we are going to protect taxpayer dollars. Is that not correct, Mr. Dodaro? Uh, that is true. I mean, you need to, to look at the outcomes you are getting from the programs, but you have to make sure you have the proper uh, oversight. Contracting is a particularly important area. Right. Uh, Congressman Davis, just uh, one other thing, uh, just knowing your interest in, te in the technology sector, uh, right now the, uh, the administration is looking at Federal data centers and trying to consolidate. Uh, there has been a big proliferation of those central, uh, the Federal data centers. Uh, what is your sense of uh, the po prospect of perhaps uh, both achieving more efficiency, protection of data, and cost savings for taxpayers? You have over 2,100 da uh, data centers right now in the government uh, for 24 different agencies. And, look, I think you could save several hundred million dollars a year by consolidating. I think you ought to put this on a fast track. You, you need to look at, at, the, at the security as you do those kinds of things. Uh, but, look, in so many areas, we are not sharing savings. We are stovepiping. Yeah. And as, as, as Mr. Dodaro said, there are so many ways we could work across agencies to store these kinds of things. You get not only economies of scale in, in this, uh, you get a lot of other uh, savings along the way if we would learn between agencies uh, to share these things. And it has just not been the culture. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dodaro, uh, going back to the subject of oil uh, and Ms. Alexander, uh, in, in response to the Chairman's uh, question uh, on uh, Mr. Kucinich's time, he said the problem is really with the royalty agreements, not so much with the law. I thought I heard you say, well, actually, there was a change, a flaw perhaps, in the law that was written in 1995 that had the effect, did it not, of pretty much exempting a lot of offshore oil drilling from any royalty payment at all. It is my understanding there was a flaw in the execution of the leases at Interior in the 90s. There are whether or not there is a flaw in the law is, is a little more of an opinion matter, but I think there, it is a fact that there were errors in the drafting and execution of the lease agreements at Interior in the 90s. That we think there are problems with the structure in the law just because it then subsequently in the court decision ruled all price thresholds in that context illegal. Um, but it is the execution of the leases was a problem. So, so in fact, yes, but with respect to this change in the law, that is something, obviously, within the purview of Congress. Well, Congress work. can solve this. That's this right. is something that Congress can come together and figure out a solution for, there, and, and we hope that you do. And so. finally, because my time is about to run out, Mr. Dodaro, any estimate on the lost revenue to the U.S. taxpayers in terms of the fact that we are 93rd out of 104 countries in royalty, uh, royalties exacted from the oil industry? I don't believe we have a current estimate in that regard, but I do think, as I mentioned earlier, that we don't have reasonable assurance that we are collecting as much as we should. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kelly of Pennsylvania for five minutes. And would the gentleman yield for just a moment? I will, sir. Thank you. Uh, I think the gentleman, uh, Mr. Connolly, or actually we will just do that, uh, uh, made a very good point, and his chairman, Mr. Langford, that, in fact, this is probably one of the areas in which the subcommittee needs to take on under procurement reform and work together, because I, I do believe that this is an example where these kinds of questions and answers here, we can provide your subcommittee some of the history so that you could work on procurement reform to make it clear that we never write a law again that could be misinterpreted by Interior, written in, incorrectly, and then ultimately not survive at the court. So I appreciate that. Uh, yield back. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dodaro, good to see you again. It is nice to have Western Pennsylvania people in the room. Listen, one of my questions, and, and you know, from, from where I am, we do a lot of touring, and I have been to a lot of meatpacking plants. And my question has always been, and I don't understand this, and maybe you can shed some light on this, because we start to talk about duplication and how many people we have in different places checking different things, and a lot of them checking the same things the same time and trying to come up with maybe some type of a, a lead of how to do it. But I know on meatpacking plants, the USDA has an inspector there every day. Is that not true? I believe so. Yeah. Well, well, and, I, and, I've, and again, as I say, from, from being there, my question then comes, you know, we have these folks there every day. And then we have a, a plan called the, uh, the Hazardous Analysis Critical Control Point. And it is, uh, let, let me just read this, considered it is pure and scientific application as a state of the art in food safety systems. Every meat plant designs their own system in accordance with USDA requirements and must operate successfully under this system. We do not need an inspector at every plant every day. We operate the same facilities, the same systems, whether inspectors are present or not. And I would just say that from what I have done in my lifetime, running footage is a lot more important than snapshots from time to time. So we have these folks in these plants every day, USDA inspectors. They are watching what these people do. In addition to that, we send in another group that comes in to go over what they have already gone over. Now, when that happens, these folks, and some of these, are, these aren't large meat processors. Some of them are in, in cases, small, small places that have maybe 50, 40, 50 uh, employees. They have got to stop what they are doing and spend a week going over the plan, which has gone over every day with the USDA inspector. And I am just trying to understand that as we go through this and we see the duplication of this and the cost to taxpayers and really the cost-benefit analysis, where in the end does it, does it serve the taxpayer or the people in those, those businesses? It, it, could you shed any light on that at all? Yeah. We have uh, we've pointed out for a number of years that the food safety system is completely fragmented. It is really not uh, operating effectively. There is a need to go to a risk-based approach, and I think that that is where you are pointing out uh, the, the real need to do that. Uh, we have recommended uh, that there be uh, a Congress commission a study with the National Academy of Sciences or some blue ribbon panel to redesign this. A lot of our food now is coming from foreign sur uh, sources, and we are still focused on domestic production a lot. So I, you know, we have said that the system right now uh, can be a lot better. Uh, and there needs to be a real look at it, and the risk-based approach is really the way to go. Yeah. Well, I, and, and I wonder about this. You know, I, I come from the private industry. I am not really well hinged with government. I just keep wondering why we keep shooting ourselves in the foot and wonder why we are limping. We have these committees. We ask these questions. We keep going over and over and over again, and everybody comes up with the same answer. There is too many regulations from too many agencies. There is too much duplication. There is too much overlap. When does it stop? When do we fix it? I, I think you, you just have to figure out which priorities Congress wants to pursue and stick with it. I mean, I, I think there is not a lot of uh, uh, substitute for just rolling up our sleeves and focusing on these areas and making sure we get results. I mean, it requires sustained follow through. They're not gonna, there, there are cultures and incentives that will keep things in place until they are broken. And the only way that they will be broken is through sustained efforts by the Congress and the administration in order to do it. Otherwise, there won't, it won't change materially. Well, I am looking forward to working with you as we try to drive to those, those same conclusions and get, get things fixed. Thanks very much. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, it is interesting, Mr. Dodaro. I have heard, uh, heard my colleagues say that you know, they would like to solve the problem uh, having to do with the leases and the non-collection uh, of royalties on that. Your report recommends that the government obtain a fair return on oil and gas produced uh, by Federal leases. Seems like a very common sense recommendation. Everyone on the panel says they agree with it. Uh, but interestingly, these no royalty issues uh, leases continue. Uh, and you agree that we are not getting a fair return currently, correct? There is not reasonable assurance we are. And then we had the report last year from Mr. Iser and his colleagues tell us that uh, on page 4, the total loss from offshore drilling may extend beyond the troubled 1998 to 99 leases. And the paragraph goes on, culminating in the end, saying, depending upon the market price of oil and natural gas, the total cost of foregone royalties could total nearly $80 billion. Uh, in fact, uh, your report, Mr. Dero says, it is between $21 billion and $53 billion, you know, dumping from these oil companies into their pockets instead of paying down our debt. Uh, we have 
you know, Shell and BP and Chevron and ExxonMobil, $485 billion in profits, and they have lost 10,200 jobs. So this is the situation we do. And, and we talk about wanting to understand the history. That is the history. Everybody knows what the problem is. Everybody knows what the, con the consequences are. Um, and I just want to make sure everybody knows there is a solution out there. All right, my Massachusetts colleague, Ed Markey, has proposed a way to address this problem. First, he recognizes that you can't go back and void the leases without risking new litigation. His, lit lit his resolutions are an alternative to that. It would not allow any new leases to companies that are currently benefiting from no royalty leases. Those companies have a choice. You either keep your no royalty leases or you can renegotiate them to begin paying a fair price and get new leases eventually on that. It is up to them. Now, my colleague has worked very closely with the Congressional Research Service to make sure that there are no constitutional issues with this problem. So my question to you, Ms. Alexander, is does taxpayers of common sense support Mr. Markey's legislation? We worked with uh, Representative Markey on that, and we support that, among other options. We, we just want to see this fixed. But that would work. But that, is, that would work, yes. Sure. So now we have the history, and now we have everybody saying that they agree that they want to resolve the problem, uh, and yet it isn't resolved. Let me tell you that last week, last Friday, Mr. Markey offered that legislation uh, on the House floor. Not a single one of our colleagues on the other side voted for it. All, right? all of the people on our side did. It was offered again this week as a floor amendment. And again, not a single one of our colleagues on the other side voted for it, and every one of the people on this side of the aisle voted for it. And last year, and the year before. I mean, go back. This is not a new idea for Mr. Markey. This is something he's repeatedly brought to the floor. So if we think that we all understand the problem, if we know the history, and if we all say we want to fix it, it always takes deeds to make things happen, not words. I hear a lot of words. We have seen no deeds. So, Ms. Alexander, can, we can offer this over and over, uh, but until our friends on the Republican side of the aisle really want to put deeds behind their words, we are not going to get much action on that. So what would you say? to convince my Republican colleagues over here who are blocking the fix to this change, what would you say they should have in mind the next time that Mr. Markey brings it to the floor? As I say, our position over time has just been just get this done, just fix it. The Markey bill does fix it, so that is one way to do it is vote for that. Come up with another solution if you have another solution that well, you think is better. Well, tell them why the Markey amendment works. Tell them why you support it. We support it because we think that it is a constitutional approach based on what we have read to putting the leaseholders of the no royalty leases in a position where they have an incentive to renegotiate. And, and simply put, we just want to not continue to give away those resources. So we are looking at lots of different options. Thank you. So let me say to my Republican colleagues, we understand the problem. We share what you say is your intention to want to resolve it. We have provided you with a perfectly good way, a legitimate way, a constitutional way to resolve it. Uh, let's work on it. And this time, the next time it comes, maybe you will vote with us on it and we will get the matter resolved, $53 billion back to our people so we are not running around cutting money from teachers, reducing Pell Grants so students can't afford college, whacking job training so people who are unemployed can't get back to work. Let's get serious. Let's do something for real. The gentleman, you? I will yield. The, uh, Ms. Alexander, uh, one of the things that the report said was that in some instances information was being provided by the oil companies erroneously, uh, and there was self-reporting. Uh, and in some instances, there was no reporting whatsoever. Could you comment on that, please? Uh, the, the issue of self-reporting, I mean, this is basically an honor system. Here is our oil. Take it. Tell us how much you have taken. We don't think that is the right way to do business. We don't think that that is Congress and the administration kind of treating taxpayers like they have a fiduciary responsibility to manage our assets aggressively. And I mean, I, I just want to give credit where credit is due. We do support the Markey fix, but we also have worked very closely with Mr. Chairman Issa. I, I think there is a real potential for a bipartisan solu solution on this. And from the taxpayers' perspective, it is just move forward. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan, for his comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. I'm sorry, Chairman. for five minutes. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for the, the, the presentations uh, from, from the entire board. Mr. Todaro, I didn't know for sure, but I was listening to, to, to the language, and I thought I picked up the Pittsburgh, and I'm glad to see. Is Jim Todaro your, your brother? Uh, okay, but I, it's, it's the Pittsburgh in the voice. But, well, listen, thank you for, for, for your presentation today. I come to this committee with a, with a background that includes times as a United States attorney. 
and in that capacity came in just after September 11th when we were dealing with the issues of, of terrorism. We each share responsibilities in other committees as well, and one of those committees on which I serve is Homeland Security. And as a result, I think as each of us went through your very comprehensive assessment of government spending in various capacities, but also the duplication, I was really struck for two reasons, one with respect to sort of the, the bureaucratic uh, overlay of so many agencies, but also what is at stake with the issue of bioterrorism. So I, I, I take a minute to read from your report, at least five departments, eight agencies, and more than two dozen presidential appointees oversee $6.4 billion related to bioterrorism. And then on the front end of this, we are saying there is no broad integrated national strategy that encompasses all of the stakeholders with biodefense responsibilities to identify the risk systematically, access the resources that are needed to do it, and then to prioritize and allocate the investment across the spectrum. So that is on the front end if we have an incident. To, I mean, to prevent an incident. Then you conclude there is no national plan to coordinate Federal, State and local efforts following a bioterror attack, and the United States lacks the technical and operational capabilities required for an adequate response. This could be Katrina all over again. We are really on the front end of a remarkable challenge. And from my work on the Homeland Security Council, bioterrorism is a very real threat. Can you take a minute and comment on this very, very important aspect of this report? Uh, yeah, yes, I would. Thank you. Uh, following September 11, there was a lot of focus on protecting the transportation system, particularly the, the airline industries. And then, you know, what we were trying to focus on, and I think the 9-11 Commission, was what are the other potential risks to the country? What are other avenues that could be pursued? Uh, for example, smuggling uh, information uh, or uh, uh, threats over the border uh, physically, uh, other modes of transportation. But the biodefense area is one that we felt for a number of years wasn't getting enough attention. And understanding what the threats were, having an appropriate plan in place to be able to do it, it is like a number of areas that really requires multiple agencies to be involved, and there really hadn't been uh, a, a means to coordinate that. Now, we have tried to elevate this to the Homeland Security Council and the National Security Council, which are well postured to be able to do this. We haven't gotten as much response as I would have liked uh, from them in this area to provide the proper leadership. So I, th I do think this is an area where congressional oversight is warranted. Uh, and from my perspective, would be very welcome to bring about some of the very important things that could be done to make sure we are in a position to detect and prevent something, not only in a position to be reacting after the fact. Mr. Davis? Uh, Mr. Meehan, let me just say, if you think that is tough, you ought to look at cybersecurity, where you have Intel, DHS, DOD, and every agency doing a different approach to FISMA, with the Federal Information Security Management Act. And I think it would be even more alarming. Well, I only have 50 seconds, but I am going to ask both of you in response to this, would you tell me how we look at creating the kind of mechanism where there is a national strategy and a focal point where we can get a single point of response that enables us to both be prepared on the front end to coordinate these assets and, as importantly, in the event that we have an incident, to be able to respond effectively uh, on the back end. What is the, it, we've asked for attention to be paid. I understand maybe you can tell me the history here, um, but what's the solution? What works best in terms of how we organize and then seek accountability? I will take a quick stab. I mean, one of the problems at the executive branch level is jurisdiction and turf over who is going to be in charge. And, and this is going to take engagement from the Congress, from both parties with the administration in figuring on a path and moving ahead. We haven't had FISMA revision since uh, 2002, uh, long overdue. But I think it is just going to take a lot of dialogue and a lot of bipartisan cooperation to move this ahead. But it has got to be done. I agree with that completely. I, I, I think there needs, this needs top-level congressional and administrative support to be able to do it. You can't work with the agencies on a peer level and expect that they are going to create this type of mechanism. That is the fundamental problem. 
And I just add, uh, I didn't grow up in your district, but I had two of my kids went to Swarthmore College in your <laughs> district. So. Well, they were there. They are obviously very bright children. Well, <laughs> and ending, ending on that high note, the gentleman's time has expired. <laughs> we now recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch, for uh, uh, five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dodaro, that is a great report. Uh, I really want to thank you for it. And I thought what, uh, among other things, was terrific about it is it was balanced. It looked at the whole problem, not just the loss uh, from duplication, uh, but also the loss from uh, inappropriate uh, tax subsidies, uh, improper uh, payments, the error rate in our payments. Uh, so it was quite comprehensive and extremely helpful. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you, too. I think this is the focus of this uh, inquiry is, is, uh, is really important. Mr. Ranking Member, really appreciate it. Uh, I am going to ask a little bit about the oil subsidies because it is an easy target for us, but astonishing that it isn't uh, taken care of. Uh, your report indicated $53 uh, billion would be saved by taxpayers if we eliminated that oil subsidy uh, for royalty-free drilling at a time of $100, uh, $100 a barrel oil. Uh, so you fully support uh, eliminating that subsidy for the oil companies it, so we can save money for the taxpayers? Now, what we were asked to calculate what it would be if that would have been in play, placed right. properly during a period of time. What I won't ask you what you yeah. support, but it would be $53 billion dollars. I, I believe that is a high end of our, okay. of, of our estimate. But what, 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 what we are trying to focus on Well, Let, well, me, let yeah, me just well, go on. I will yeah. come back to you in a minute. Okay. Ms. Alexander, you indicated that was, uh, again, I applaud you because you are taking a comprehensive approach here, looking at all the elements uh, of how the taxpayer is getting hammered unnecessarily. Uh, but that oil subsidy was something you spoke about as well uh, that we should get rid of. Uh, the oil companies uh, disagree. <laughs> And they have spent about $340 million in the past two years lobbying to retain this taxpayer help. It is the oil, company job, oil company's job to make money drilling oil and selling it. It is Congress's job to be, have a fiduciary role and take care of taxpayer dollars. We right, are so looking out for the taxpayers, and we think that there is room for a fix. All right. Is it your view that if there are going to be taxpayer subsidies, uh, and that is an expense to every taxpayer in the country, uh, but the intention is to create jobs that that subsidy uh, should, be go, should go to emerging technologies and industries, not mature and profitable uh, industries. We take a skeptical look for all, at all subsidies. And certainly, as a starting point, we want to know what we are getting for our tax dollars. If we are putting a, a dollar into an industry, we want to know why we are doing it and what, what our goals are. Are we trying to get jobs right. out of it and we are not getting jobs? Then it is an ineffective subsidy. Okay. If it is a very profitable industry right. that is mature and should be able to take care of itself, then it shouldn't need subsidies. We are going to be skeptical about subsidies to new and emerging technologies unless well, they have very high stand, performance standards. In, and and there is a reason and a time frame. And, and basically, that skepticism is appropriate. It should be applied to a tax expenditure, which costs the taxpayer money, just as it should be applied to any line item expenditure in the budget, correct? We, we see it that way, yes. All right. Mr. Davis, some people say you are a real smart politician. <laughs> I want to ask you really for some advice. I am a, a reform politician. All right. <laughs> you know, in this, here, in this room, we have the Democrats who tend to hammer away on what we see as tax uh, giveaways. Uh, and a lot of times the other side of the aisle is, is focusing on duplication. Uh, my view, we are both right. Uh, where there is duplication, we ought to eliminate it. Where there is a, a freebie tax subsidy, we ought to eliminate that. Uh, but we are sort of arrayed uh, on opposite sides of the line here. And I know that the, the chairman and the ranking member want to save taxpayers money. That is the ultimate goal. I am wondering what you would think of us trying to pair off areas where we agree. In other words, Mr. Langford is doing good work in his subcommittee. Uh, you mentioned, for instance, duplication that makes no sense, VA and DOD records. Why don't we have one set of medical records? What if we paired that with getting rid of, say, the ethanol subsidy, where there does seem to be some bipartisan support, and you are doing them together? Or another pairing might be these oil subsidies uh, that just serve no purpose and cost the taxpayers $53 billion, uh, and we pair that with uh, following your advice, where we have different Federal agencies requiring the States to accommodate each one of their different standards for verif verification. It makes absolutely no sense. So the, how do we my frustration here at times is that it seems like it is a political impediment uh, that 
inhibits us from taking appropriate action that can make real progress. And in your testimony, you suggested to us that we look in the mirror, and frankly, I think that is pretty good advice. And my goal here would be to save taxpayers' money. Where there is duplication we, we can agree on, it ought to be eliminated, let's do it. Uh, where there is a tax expenditure that is just a ripoff uh, from the perspective of the taxpayer, let's eliminate it. I mean, from a moving ahead, making progress on what the chairman and ranking member want to accomplish here, do you think that makes some sense? Well, it, it, it not only makes sense, it is essential if we are going to move ahead. You have a Democratic administration, you need an administration buy-in, you have a Congress that is divided. And when it comes to waste, one man's, uh, you say one man's pork is another man's steak. But on a lot of these efficiency issues, I think we ought to be able to come together on this committee, uh, sit down. We are not going to agree on everything, but there are enough things we agree on. Put together that report, and then you have to drive it. Then you have got to go to the administration, you have got to go to the floor. And look, let's face it, there are interest groups outside of this committee room that want to weigh in on some of these subsidies uh, and the like. And it is easy to talk in a vacuum when you have your bean counters here. These are the numbers. But when you get outside, uh, you know, it becomes a little more difficult. So this committee, I think, could play a very vital role in coming together with a strong bipartisan uh, report uh, and pushing that, holding hearings on that. I think you could get getting everybody back again once you get some agreement on this and trying to drive it. The, the frustration I felt up here in, in 14 years in the House is just there is no sustainability to this. You get a report, you have a hearing, you get a little momentum, and it, and it goes, you forget about it and you move on to the next, the new, new thing. Uh, but this is something this committee was empowered to do uh, when, it, when, it, when it was formed uh, back in the 50s. And I think it is something that if we can, we are not going to agree on everything. But there are enough things we agree we could put together a pretty juicy report and, and uh, I think save the taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars. So I think it is a good suggestion. I would give you more time if I possibly could, because you were on all the right, right messages. Thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania. We are a very Pennsylvania-oriented uh, committee, as you know, Mr. Platts, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, certainly thank all three of our witnesses. Uh, great to have all of you here and your insights. And, uh, Mr. Davis, I, I actually, uh, with all respect to the current chairman, I always want to say, Mr. Chairman, great to have you back as well. <laughs> let, let it out. Just keep letting it out. <laughs> well, um, your insights uh, are certainly very helpful to us, and um, I want to commend Senator Coburn for having sponsored the legislation that resulted in this report and uh, the important work of GAO and now following uh, through on the, on the assignment. And really what I see is uh, the beginning of the process, the first of what will be hopefully a lot of dialogue between GAO, this committee, and, uh, and its important work. And, uh, Tom, you, you touched on it perfectly, sustainability, that, that we don't just talk about these things, but then we follow through. And um, as when you were chairman and now with Chairman Ice, I have the privilege of chairing the subcommittee on uh, government organization efficiency and financial management. And I assure you we will do our best as a subcommittee to sustain this effort from the uh, legislative side and working with, uh, with all the parties. Um, on a specific issue, I mean, when you think about what is in the report, uh, what is highlighted and the, and the inefficiencies and duplication, the, um, the waste of resources, teacher quality, you know, education of our kids, uh, employment training, especially with unemployment, you know, over 9 percent for almost two years, um, DOD, Homeland Security, I mean, these are all top priorities for our country and for our citizens, yet we know we can do a lot better with the resources we are putting into them. I guess two first questions, uh, General Dodaro, to you, um, and, and I, this probably would be in maybe a follow-up hearings with you or staff and uh, on the subcommittee level. As you looked at some of the duplication, and, and such as the $4 billion on teacher, uh, teacher uh, quality, um, is there any ability to give uh, even a guesstimate of savings, administrative savings, if we took those, what, 82 different programs into even half that number? Uh, any ability to give a guesstimate of, of, of that $4 billion, how much could we likely save uh, from, from eliminating the uh, duplication? Uh, we'll go, I'll go back and take a look and work with the team. But I don't think we were able to do it because there are a lot of limitations on the amount of information that is available uh, on what it costs to administer some of these programs, particularly right. those in this case that are administered through the State and local level. Right. Uh, but we do believe there is plenty of opportunity here to consolidate programs. And as I mentioned earlier, 
uh, in the administration's uh, proposal for education reform, they are already proposing to consolidate 38 of these programs into, into 11. And right. so I think there is a lot of opportunities. I don't have a cost estimate. I wish I did. Well, and I think that is a positive sign here, your reference to uh, Secretary Duncan and DOE, that looking at trying to be proactive in that consolidation effort to, to be more efficient. A follow on, and I think it is a similar answer that you don't have the ability to have the detail at this point, and that is when you look at, and I am going to stay with teacher quality, uh, teacher preparation, um, at those 82 programs, I don't think you probably have the data available to you right now that to do a cost-benefit analysis to say, all right, we have these 82 programs. You know, these five over here we can show are really doing a great job. Um, these other 77 are struggling. You know, so we, when we look to consolidate, is that accurate that, that you at this point don't have the, the data or the info to be able to get to that detail, that cost-benefit analysis? Uh, that is correct, it's especially for the smaller programs. And when we do mention in the report that a number of the smaller yeah. programs are so small, it is hard to evaluate them. And, th right. and that makes that sense under 50 that, million right. uh, number, uh, that, that, that what administrative costs, you know, what the savings would be. Right. That is correct. I, 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 in looking ahead to, uh, to the hearing process, um, I got to tell you, the temptation is to try to make the point about the duplication is to invite one representative from all 82 programs on just teacher education to come, we would fill the room. There won't be any seats left <laughs> to make the point that your report does, that, that we need to do a lot better here. Um, uh, additional questions I'm going to try to squeeze in here. Um, improper payments, huge issue. You referenced $125 billion as the, probably the low end. You know, we, we, that's what we know or think we know about who knows how much is really out there. Any specific recommendations? Because when we think of how to balance the budget and deficit reduction, um, you know, it's entitlement reform and two of the biggest areas of improper payments: Medicaid, Medicare. Any specific areas you want to point us towards uh, regarding improper payments in those uh, two uh, programs? Uh, the first thing I would say in the Medicare area, there needs to be an estimate for the prescription drug component. Right now, there isn't, and and so the estimate's incomplete. Uh, there are opportunities uh, to use more information technology up front to help detect, and we are looking at and evaluating opportunities right now. We talked about it at the high-risk hearing with Chairman Issa, and so we are looking at, at that issue. I think the Improper Payments uh, Elimination and Reporting Act that was passed by Congress last year is a very important vehicle. It lowers the thresholds. It requires accountability. It requires regular reporting, setting of targets, and, and follow-up and transparency in reporting. So I, I do think this is a, a really important area that, with sustained attention, uh, that we can make a lot of progress on going well, forward. Ho hopefully, as uh, we can sustain that effort with you and, and Chairman Davis, did you have something? You I, I would to just add. Uh, look, on uh, improper payments, I think has been constantly a, a problem for the, for government, and this legislation helps. There are so many great um, software items out there on fraud detection, anomaly detection, the like that aren't being utilized. I think you need to continue to push that from here. And I just add, share and savings contracts are something the government needs to look at in some of these areas. That is basically that you don't pay anything unless you get a return, and then you can do a percent from that, and it is negotiated uh, down. Uh, they are legal under the FAR, but they are rarely used. But it is a great way to get something out there quickly. It doesn't have to come out of budgets at this time. It is a net net to the government. And I just I, I throw that out for discussion. I thank, thank the gentleman. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, for five minutes. Thank you very much for this hearing, Mr. Mr. Chairman. It is a very important and helpful hearing. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Darrow and, and my good friend, Mr. Davis, my regional neighbor and good personal friend. Uh, but I am going to give you a pass on the uh, topic du jour. I am not going to ask about oil subsidies. In fact, I am going to ask you about a, a, a subsidy that lies way beneath the surface. I am ranking member was chair of a committee that has to do with property and property disposal, also with building and leasing. Uh, I note, uh, Mr. Dodaro, that among your, your list of areas identified was, and I would like you to, to elaborate upon it, uh, because it is stated, it stated so tersely, improved cost analysis used for making Federal facility ownership and leasing decisions could save tens of millions of dollars. Let me give you an example. We just built a beautiful Department of Transportation building just a few years ago. It is huge. It was state of the art. 
guess what? Fifteen years, we built it, the Department of Transportation will always be there as a headquarters building. We built it, gave it a $15 million, it's built by a, 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 um, um, a developer. We have a 15-year lease on it. When that lease is, is out, we probably shall have bought the building, and then we will start buying the building again. I believe this has a lot to do with scoring. Uh, what changes do you think should be made and who should make it? We run up against this huge, humongous loss. It is not tens of millions, it is billions of dollars, because we don't do real estate the way the private sector does it. How should we change scoring? Who should do it? Is it administrative? Does it take an act of Congress? We have uh, recommended that OMB come up with a proposal to be able to deal with this issue. Uh, that has not been done yet, but it is a combination of action by OMB working with CBO and the budget committees that really would have to make a change in the, in the scoring rules. I think it is appropriate. There needs to be flexibility. It is not always one way or the other, but there needs to be a good cost-benefit study, and the government and the taxpayers would benefit. Yeah, all I am asking for is that the Federal Government not have one way of doing real estate transactions while the rest of the country does it another way. Uh, the first thing you have got to look at is why does everybody else do it that, that way? Why do you buy a home with a mortgage? And if you are the Federal Government, you have to put the money straight down. <laughs> why is that better for the taxpayers? Uh, Mr. Davis, I was interested, uh, um, uh, I'm, in, in light of your, your this is so Davis-like, win-win approach to to things, this, this uh, uh, notion of, of uh, tr trying to find uh, ways to, to work together on these things. I, I noted that in property disposal, I have just signed a letter with the chairman of the uh, subcommittee in which we are asking GSA for access to their, um, to their database on excess property. Now, the President has a whole study on excess property going on, and now you see our committee interested uh, as well. So you see the administration, you see this committee, and you see the, the, the appropriate subcommittee all going at the same uh, issue, all seeing that there are dollars there. What role, Mr. Davis, having been chairman of this uh, committee, do you think the committee should play now that there are so many actors? interested in this low-hanging fruit? Well, and there is an additional actor, Martha Johnson, the administrator of GSA, has just appointed her, is putting together her own advisory committee on this uh, subject, too, of, of doing away with uh, sur surplus properties. You have a lot of cooks in the kitchen right now. This committee needs to drive an outcome. I think you need to hold their feet to the fire. We need to put some time limits on this. This has been around a long time, ever, ever, before I came to Congress, trying to dispose of property or utilize dilapidated properties in a way that we can rehabilitate them, use them, sometimes share it with the private sector. Uh, what, what we need to do here at the subcommittee level is continue to hold hearings and drive it and keep their feet to the fire. And you have got to put time limits on this or the clock runs out. But there are, as I think Mr. Darrow's report shows, a lot of savings in this if we can get it right. I just add one other thing on the scoring. I hate to mention this, but you get frustrated. Congress can always direct scoring, too, if you don't get any action out of the congressional. What do you mean, direct uh, uh, scoring? You can direct scoring. You can write the rules for scoring. We've done it. I don't say we do it all the time, but we've done it with some frequency. Save a lot of money. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. And the, uh, another former chairman of the committee, Mr. Burton, recognized for five minutes. Tom, it's good seeing you again. I understand you are out there in the private sector making lots of money, so <laughs> it is good to see you. Look at he's blushing, so he must be. Yeah, not this morning, but I hear you. <laughs> well, anyhow, welcome back. It is good seeing you. And, and this picture simply doesn't do you justice. Uh, but anyhow, uh, I would like to make a, a brief comment about uh, Mr. Tierney's uh, remarks a few minutes ago when he was here. I wish he was still here. We checked on the uh, on the issue that he raised on that recommittal motion. And uh, the reason that recommittal motion failed was because they were, in effect, uh, I don't like to use the word term blackmailing, but blackjacking the oil companies into renegotiating leases that had already been agreed to in order to get a new lease. And uh, that is something that I think most people would agree is a violation of law. Uh, the leases, some of them are for 20, 25, 30 years. And there was a case, and I am stating all this for the record, 
There was a case, the Kerr-McGee case in 2007 that went to court uh, where they tried to force a renegotiation of a contract and Kerr-McGee won because the contract was valid and the government had no right to go back and insist on a change in that uh, simply because they wanted to get more uh, back from the, uh, from the company. Now, I think there is a way that we can do this in the future. We have talked about this up here, and that is we could encourage them uh, when we negotiate new leases, not threatening the old leases, but when we renegotiate, when we negotiate new leases to create a better uh, a way to uh, get those funds back that would help uh, bring more money into the Treasury and reduce the debt. Now, I would like to go into this a little bit further. This is a little off the subject at hand, but I think it is extremely important. And we have been talking about this, and I have noticed on the news in the last few days there are more and more commentators and uh, experts, quote, unquote, that are talking about it, and that is our dependence on foreign energy. And it plays into what we are talking about in an in a unusual way. We import uh, about 63 percent of our energy. It, it, back in 1972, when we had the oil embargo, it was about 20 5 or 26 percent. So we have more than doubled our dependency on Middle Eastern oil, oil coming from Mexico, Canada, and uh, Venezuela, the communist dictator down there, Chavez. And so we are in a position right now where as if uh, these oil supplies were in, in jeopardy, we could see uh, the cost of oil per barrel go through the roof and the cost of gasoline and other uh, things that we use uh, oil for, as far as energy is concerned, go through the roof. Right now, I got some gasoline last night, which may not be of interest to anybody, but it was regular gasoline, and it cost me $3.57 a gallon, and that was the lowest that I could find on the entire George Washington Parkway. So the cost is higher than that here in D.C., and it is going up. Some people say that if there is a disruption of the oil supplies coming in from the Middle East alone, if we had a blockage of the Suez Canal or the Straits of Hormuz or the Persian Gulf, that we could see uh, oil and gas costs go through the roof. You could see $5, 6 a gallon gas. Now, we deliver in this country a great deal of our resources by truck. Uh, T. Boone Pickens was in to see me uh, about a week or two ago, and he told us if we converted or got all of the 18 wheelers to use natural gas, we could cut our dependence on foreign oil by 50 percent within the next decade. That one thing. And yet we are not drilling or doing anything to explore for, uh, for energy in this country. We can't get oil leases, new oil leases. We can't, uh, we're getting all kinds of environmental pro uh, issues raised that say we can't drill here, we can't drill there. We've got trillions of gallons of coal shale that could be converted to uh, gas, for, to, to oil. We've got oil all over this country in the Anwar and off the, off the uh, uh, continental shelf and in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. We've got trillions of uh, cubic feet of natural gas, and we're not doing anything. And so we are, in effect, creating a greater dependency on foreign energy than we ever have in the history of this country. We have gone from 25 percent to 60-some percent dependence on foreign energy since we had the oil embargo where people were walking four blocks to get a can of gas to get to work. And so uh, if you just give me another 30 seconds, Mr. Chairman, I think it is extremely important, and I know this is off the subject and I really appreciate you being tolerant of my <coughs> comments here, but I think it is really important when we are talking about renegotiating or negotiating oil leases or gas leases or whatever we are talking about, that we realize we have a huge dependency on foreign energy. And this country, from an economic standpoint and a defense standpoint, could be in a terrible situation if we don't move toward energy independence. And I think all of us, all of us on this dais and all of us, regardless of whether we are Democrat or Republican, ought to be talking about ways that we can move in this direction as quickly as possible. Because if we don't and things go south in the, in the, in the Middle East or in Venezuela or elsewhere, we could really see problems, lights off, uh, gasoline going through the roof, the cost of all the goods and services that are truck going through the roof, and an inflationary spiral that could kill this country. And with that, um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Burke, can I react to that for just a second? I mean, I, I think you are you're on, but can I just make one comment? Sure. Well, we have got to remember, the Stone Age didn't end because they ran out of stones. And this is our dependency on oil. It is not going to end because we run out of oil. There are going to be alternative fuels developed. 
And that, I think, continues to be the long-term strategy. What is the most frustrating is about Congress's inability, and I was part of this, to come to grips with some kind of defined energy policy that has more domestic production, as you have noted, uh, more uh, research and incentives into alternative fuels, which we have started to do, and then uh, more conservation. I mean, it is a, a three-pronged deal. We, yes. The party should be able to come together on this or exactly what you say is going to happen. Mr. Chairman, let me just make one brief comment, and that is the things that uh, Chairman uh, Davis just mentioned is absolutely accurate. We need a comprehensive approach. But a lot of these things they are talking about are going to take time. It is going to take 5, 10, 15 years. We don't have the luxury of time, and we need to get, uh, get moving on uh, energy independence right now. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back, and having had the privilege to serve under both former chairmen, how could I not agree with both of you? Uh, and, but you, you make great points that when we talk about energy independence, it is economic security, uh, it is national security, uh, they are all intertwined. <laughs> so uh, with that, um, yeah, yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman in Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And let me uh, uh, first welcome Mr. Davis back. Uh, and your portrait and Mr. Burton certainly looks good in this freshly painted hearing room, don't you think? <laughs> Let me uh, let me uh, start my questioning with uh, uh, Mr. Dodera, and thank you for your testimony and recommendations on ways we can make the federal government more efficient and save taxpayer dollars. Uh, I would like to focus on the Department of Defense. I'm concerned about DOD's pattern of negative appearances in GAO reports. Uh, as we continue to increase DOD's budget, the agency continues to be plagued by inefficiencies, du duplicative programs, waste and, in some cases, fraud. Uh, in your report, you identify the DOD's military health system as an area of concern for duplication and redundancy. The report states that the DOD military health system has no central command authority or single entity accountable for minimizing cost and achieving efficiency. And that is very troubling given its mission. Uh, can you share with the committee the annual cost of DOD's military health system and what are the projected cost increases through 2015? Uh, yeah. It is about $50 billion. Uh, Fifty billion for the health care system. Right, right. Wow. And and uh, you know we point out in the report too that you know health care costs at DOD just like they are in other parts of our economy are growing. And uh, the area that we mentioned in terms of the military health care commands uh, is uh, something that's been studied by the Defense Science Board and others. There are recommendations within DOD to do it and. They pursued uh, a strategy that had minimal changes involved, and we think if they pursue a broader strategy, it would be very important. Also, in the health care area, uh, Congressman, the cost of prescription drugs is a fast growing part and component of health care, and we think that DOD and VA working together, which they were doing a few years ago, could yield some benefits by leveraging their purchasing power as well, and they have agreed to start revisiting that issue. Thank you for that response. And, 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 and what, what Im impact do you think the system's redundancy and command structure issues have on those costs? And, well, uh, the uh, estimates that were made uh, at the time, uh, savings could be achieved between $250 million and, and uh, I think I believe over $400 million a year, depending upon the nature of the consolidation. Okay. So, so that, would, that would kind of uh, help save uh, taxpayers if they took the recommendations and implemented them. That, that's correct. And, and right now they are pretty much ignoring them because nobody. Well, they've, they've, really they've made some they've made some minimal changes in that regard, but we think they could they could do more. Okay, and then you have recommended alternative concepts uh, that have been on the table for a while. Uh, in addition to your report, the Center for Naval Analysis did one and. 2006, and you also report that DOD officials generally agree with the facts and findings of your analysis on their health system. Uh, with rising costs in the billions, 
for DOD's health system and clear inefficiency, do you think DOD is doing enough right now to make improvements? I, I think they can do more, as we pointed out in our report. And, uh, you know, we have encouraged them to, to do so. And we will continue to do uh, studies, uh, you know, basically uh, outlining what some of the options would be. For example, a single military command is, a, is an option. Uh, there are other options that could be pursued, but this is a case where there is uh, cultural uh, uh, stovepiping by the services and there needs to be some broader leadership brought to bear, and I think it is warranted given the fast rising health care costs. Thank you for that response. Mr. Davis, uh, going back to, the, to a, an efficient energy policy, um, and, and one argument we hear is that eliminating these subsidies would cost jobs. I note that from 05 to 09, the top five oil companies have reduced their U.S. workforce by more than 10,000. What would happen if we shifted, shifted these subsidies from oil, oil to wind or other domestic producing energy initiatives? Uh, wouldn't that spur job creation in this country? You know, I'm not. I'm just not an expert on those on those areas. I mean, I'm one who would let the marketplace set that rather than some of these incentives. But we are starting to incentivize wind. We are starting to incentivize some of these other areas, and it is having an effect not just on job creation, but prepositioning us for the future in a global economy. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, before I uh, recognize Dr. Gosar, uh, we've had a request from two members who have had to leave the dais that uh, there be unanimous consent for. Uh, the general to uh, revise and extend your report. I understand there is some additional detail that has been requested. That your people say they could, they could give us in supplemental for this report. Uh, is that amenable to you, uh, that we will leave the record open for you to supplement with any additional details, for example, the 80 programs and four agencies naming them, those sort of things? We realize that is not easily put together in one day. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I think yeah. thank, thank I thank the gentleman. Dr. Gosar is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Davis, um, I'm currently co-sponsoring uh, Resolution 606, um, which establishes a bipartisan, presidentially appointed Sunset Commission that identifies failed programs and those that are not achieving their goals to review them and subject them for termination. I suspect the Commission would review this committee's work. With your experience, what are your thoughts on this if this legislation were enacted into law? Well, if I were in Congress, I would co-sponsor it. I think that is a good place to start. One of the things you have to remember is when you start talking about programs that don't work or that have expired and the like, uh, that there are a lot of interest groups out there that really don't care about efficiency. And they push members and uh, they have their say in this by the time it is over. So it is great to have a GAO or a commission like this that can call the balls and strikes. And then it gets harder for some of these groups to defend uh, some of these uh, subsidies and some of these programs that may not uh, uh, doing it. So I think it is a, it's a wonderful idea. It is another starting point on this. The only point I would make is in all of this, uh, this is sustainability keeping the momentum going. It is a lot easier to make government work more efficiently and to take costs out of government in terms of delivering service than it is to cut programs. And that is where our focus needs to be. Thank you. Mrs. Ms. Alexander, would you see this as a real benefit that the taxpayers could get behind? Um, we have supported different forms of Sunset Commissions in the past. It is something that we would look at the details of your resolution, but certainly we were open to the idea. Good. Uh, Mr. Dodaro, um, to Mr. Mack's earlier questions, you mentioned real property owned and maintained by the government um, that are unnecessary and, and not being used. In your, what, in your view, what is the best mes method to get the agencies to part with this property and sold to the private sector? What are our next steps to make this happen? Uh, we have uh, recommended in the past OMB chair, and they do have a real property council at, at this point in time. I think Congress should require regular reports on a quarterly basis from OMB about what the plans are to be to dispose of property. Uh, right now, there are over 45,000 buildings that are underutilized. Uh, that has grown uh, over the past year uh, by 1,800 uh, buildings. Uh, the cost to maintain underutilized properties over $1.6 billion a year. So I think there needs to be a plan. Now, the administration has set goals uh, to try to dispose of uh, property by the end of 2012, but I think it is part of Congress's responsibility to hold them accountable for uh, what progress they are making toward achieving those goals. Thank you very much. I yield the balance of my time. Uh, would the gentleman yield? I, I would yield. Thank you. 
Mr. Dodaro, have you looked at some of the excess property in sufficient detail to look at things, for example, I was out at, at Moffett Field on a committee fact finding, and we discovered that, that NASA was utilizing a relatively small portion of it, leasing out a small portion of it profitably, and then leasing out for de minimis amounts, large amounts of it for non-core business that was important to the community. Have you looked at those sort of things of whether or not agencies holding land that are not technically underutilized but, but being utilized for non-core functions, do you look at any of those sort of items? I would have to go back and check with my team uh, and to be able to provide. I will provide you an answer for the record, Mr. Chairman, on, on that. I appreciate that. The one additional one is you talked in terms uh, on the other side was asking questions, and I think it was very insightful. You were almost saying we need a second Goldwater Nichols, that we need to go further in merging the command structures of the military from a standpoint of spending. Is that, is that pretty much a succinct part of your report? I, I think there needs to be some outside uh, intervention in order to break some of the stove pipes down at DOD. Uh, Chairman Davis, uh, you have certainly seen this, and you were here for the BRAC process. Uh, would you say that, in fact, that is one of the things the committee should look at is lessons learned and failures, if you will, post-BRAC, when they no longer belong to the military and yet they are still costing the taxpayers? Well, one of the problems, I mean, the McKinney Act was passed, I think, with, with the greatest of intentions, but at the end of the day, I think the priorities have shifted from how do we use this land in the community in some cases to how do we put this back on the tax rolls, which also help those communities, and how do we get money back to the Federal Government? We are borrowing 40 cents in the dollar. It is just not sustainable. We have to start looking at costs. I agree. Thank you. And one last question as a follow-up, uh, Ms. Ryan, or Ms. Alexander. You have been very supportive of many fixes. I remember that your uh, organization and several others were supportive of us stripping the, the, uh, the courts of the ability to make the decision that they unfortunately made that, that puts us with these billions being lost through oil leases that were flawed. Uh, and I know that we agree to disagree on whether or not Mr. Markey's uh, fix would be held constitutional or whether it would fall into that punitive. But more broadly, have you looked at what could be gained by Congress taking all of the various subsidies, oil being one of them, but there are other energy subsidies, and requiring them to be brought together, something that follows a theme that we have been talking about here today? Uh, we haven't specifically looked at how to package all the um, energy subsidies together. We tend to, um, our, our work has been to look at individual subsidies, but certainly we recognize the need for a comprehensive energy policy and to look at whether or not each dollar is, is going towards a common goal. So that is something we would be happy to work with the committee on. We have looked at lots of different energy subsidies across different fuels, and we try to look at them together. But uh, you know, we understand the, the difficulty of looking at them all side by side. We certainly don't think that um, we have apples to apples comparisons coming out of the administration or Congress as often as we would like. Well, we look forward to working together on that. With that, we recognize the gentlelady from New York for five minutes. And first, I would like to uh, welcome my former colleague, Tom Davis, who did an extraordinary job as chairman of this committee, on which I was honored to serve. Thank you. Uh, he was always a good fighter for the partisan cause, but also reasonable and listened to the minority. And we worked together on a lot of good bills. It is good thank to see you. We miss you, you, Tom. Welcome back. Thank you. And I, I want to thank uh, Mr. Donaro for your excellent report. Uh, it is really very helpful, and, and the Chairman for focusing on it, uh, because this is a time we need to look at ways to protect uh, taxpayers' dollars and, and uh, start re reducing that deficit and debt. And, and your report says that some oil and gas companies are not paying what they owe under existing leases. Uh, I think that is a little bit of an understatement. And your investigation examined royal report, royalty reports for 2006 and 2007 and found that many were simply missing. They also found many sales reports were erroneous. And specifically, uh, your report states that you found numerous instances in which oil and gas production data were missing or sales data appeared to be erroneous. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. And, and for just these two years alone, 2006 and 2007, uh, your investigators found that oil and gas companies may have withheld $117 million 
in uncollected uh, royalties. That is a staggering amount. And uh, your report indicates that one reason uh, this may be happening is because we rely on oil companies to self-report. Uh, so. there, there needs to be more verification by the Interior Department of the data to make sure that the Federal Government is getting you know, there is reasonable assurance that they are getting the revenues that are there. And so there is a set schedule for verifications that are supposed to occur, but the, the Department was way behind uh, in maintaining that schedule. Well, why in the world are we relying on them to self-report when we have documentation that they are not capable of self-reporting accurately? Why in the world don't we have the, the royalties uh, uh, reported by what is due by the agency? or at least a third party? Why in the world are we relying on, uh, on the oil and gas industry that is not reporting accurately according to your own study after study after study after study? Yeah, well, the, the, you know, we, our recommendation is there is more verification needs to be done uh, by them. They're, they're, it, but but you are still you, letting the companies verify, correct? Uh, no, Interior needs to verify. Interior Company, needs to verify. Yeah, having having self-reported information can work if there is verification by the Department so the checks and balances, you know, rather than go out and have uh, people independently, you know, measuring it. So it 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 can work, but the Department has to do their part to protect the taxpayers, and that's what you're saying, and that's what we've said in our recommendations. Well, also in your recommendation, your report proposes that the Federal Government use independent third-party data to provide greater assurance that royalties are accurately paid. But my question, do you think it is better to have a third party or just have Interior do a better job verifying? Well, Interior needs to do a better job verifying it. They can use their own verification. They can use other third parties to corroborate as well. That is what we do in doing our audits and verifications. You should use everything that is available to you to corroborate. Uh, data to make sure that the reporting is complete as possible and the taxpayers are protected and we are getting the revenue that we uh, deserve. And how much do you estimate we would be able to keep bring in if they verified it in an appropriate way? Yeah, we, we don't have a, a, an estimate right now. And, and uh, why is it taking so long? Are, are they verifying now in a better way? Have they taken the steps to uh, respond to your recommendations? Uh, we will be. They are starting to from the team, and we are going to be following up and staying on this, and we will provide regular reports to this committee. Well, do you think it is important that maybe we need to legislate that they verify <laughs> well, to make sure it happens? Yeah, well, what, what do we do to make sure this happens? Well, I, I, I think you ought to have Interior up here and explain what they are doing and, and the importance of doing it. I, and I think a regular oversight is uh, important. Uh, you know, we have done work. The Inspector General has done work over there. We are continuing to do our part. Uh, and so I think that uh, it is good to have sustained follow-up with the Department that is responsible for handling these matters. Well, I regret that there was an amendment that I authored in another committee, and the debate went on just until now. So I missed a, 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 lot, a great deal of your testimony. In the 21 seconds left, I would like to ask you, in your report, what other area in government can we manage better and save funds? Obviously, the oil and gas is uh, historically been uh, a, an area of tremendous abuse, particularly on oil extracted from federally owned lands. But what other category in government do you think, if we managed it better, we would be able to save taxpayers' dollars and make a, a dent in this uh, terrible deficit we have? Well, I think that the, our report discusses opportunities virtually across government. The Department of Defense is, is an opportunity there, I think, for significant savings. I also mentioned the need to focus on revenue collection, uh, you know, where we are not cutting, we are actually getting more that we are owed in from a revenue standpoint beyond the interior issue. I think the IRS uh, can and, and should implement a number of our recommendations to take that area on. I think we have also recommended that tax expenditures be brought under regular review. Uh, that is almost uh, you know, as much as discretionary spending in, in a year in revenue foregone. So I think all those are, are really good opportunities uh, to be able to save monies and, and, and to be more efficient. Uh, but in tackling our deficit, uh, efforts there have to go beyond uh, just these programs and to entitlement uh, spending as well. My time has expired. Thank you. I think, General Lady, uh, Mr. Davis, I think you wanted to. Uh, respond Lady, also. I just wanted. To, Mr. Issa had asked a question uh, earlier, where he talked about uh, asked something similar. There's a lot of savings between agencies, 
where they can charge sharing services. And I know they allude, allude to that in the report. That, that wasn't just uh, the, the focus of this report. But agencies can share services. Right now it is just very stovepipe in terms of the way they look at it, the way they are budgeted, and they are reluctant to do that. But you could save literally billions of dollars, uh, probably tens of billions, if they could share services between agencies, as we talk about the best illustration being medical records between VA and DOD. There is no reason you need two separate lists. But that is the kind of things, the collaboration between agencies that is not really existing now that could save a lot. I thank the gentleman, and in, in, in closing, and, and actually for the gentlelady's uh, edification, too, because I think the, uh, uh, Mr. Dodaro did it very well and is explaining something to us. This third party data that we want to explore further uh, with the GAO, the idea of when an oil company takes oil, they sell it, they put it onto a tanker that is weighed and measured, they offload it and it is metered. This is all third party data that if we gathered it all, it would be almost impossible not to see any discrepancies between what is reported and so on. And this is also earlier what they said about the IRS. The fact is that if somebody says, I don't have any money, and yet you see credit card receipts saying they are spending money, if that data is compared within the Internal Revenue Service, that third party collaboration, because remember, IRS is voluntarily reported too, but some people don't quite report accurately as they discovered when people were saying what they lost in Louisiana and it didn't match anything that they had ever declared. So I look forward to working with the gentlelady on that. In closing, uh, particularly for Mr. Dodaro, uh, our intention of the committee is to have you back on a roughly quarterly basis. I hope that either you or a designated representative would be able to do that so we can continue this dialogue uh, in a way to stay on top of what you are doing and, of course, on top of uh, what the administration is agreeing to do. Additionally, I want to again re repeat for the record that the commitment to go after a number of areas you have covered here today, including natural gas and oil and find constitutional ways to keep from losing the money that we are losing. And particularly, uh, we are going to have the new agency, the Ocean Energy Management, the old MMS. We intend to have them back. We, Out of deference to the reorganization that was announced by Interior, we are trying to give them a reasonable amount of time. But, uh, Carolyn, we are going to have them in specifically as we did when Chairman Davis had them in repeatedly. Uh, so I want to thank the witnesses today. I would like to have you all back. I suspect because of your expertise, we ha will have you all back, and this committee stands adjourned. And my statement in the record. Oh, okay. and, sorry. And, uh, unanimous uh, consent. Unanimous consent that your statement and all statements may be placed into the record for up to seven legislative days, and all of you, by unanimous consent, may revise and extend for that same period of time. We stand adjourned. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. I just wanted to mention I was on the floor of the horn and doing a tribute to him.